My name is Monty Self. I'm one of the senior staff chaplains here at the Baptist Health Medical Center, Little Rock. I'd like to welcome you to our annual Good Friday service at Baptist Health. Every year at this time, I'm always reminded of about two decades ago when I was teaching at the Kiev Theological Seminary. One Sunday Easter morning, I got up in front of a group of Russians and I looked out and in Russian, I calmly spoke, Christ is risen. A thunderous repose came back, Christ is risen indeed. Three times, Christ is risen. Thunderously, Christ is risen indeed. In the Orthodox tradition, they follow this every Easter Sunday morning. But before we can celebrate the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, we must first reflect upon the crucifixion that occurred on that Good Friday. We all join me as we uh, enter before the Lord and we worship this Good Friday service. Good morning, I'm Ricky, one of the resident chaplains here at Baptist Health. Let us pray. God, fill us with gratitude and grace to sit in the stillness that mourns your son's death, yet celebrates the, the ultimate triumph of the cross. As Jesus was ignored, laughed at, and unjustly crucified, let us never take for granted his huge gift of love when he sacrificed his life to take our place. Help remind us that his pain will not have the last word, and his death is not the end of the story. Thank you, Jesus, that by your wounds we are healed, and because of your sacrifice we can live free. Thank you that sin and death have been conquered and, have, and help us walk in your hope, truth, and strength forever. Amen. Good morning. I am Reverend Dion Broughton, one of the resident chaplains here at Baptist Health. Please join me in our Old Testament reading. Found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 3 through 7. And the word of the Lord reads, He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquitted with affirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised and was held and held him of no, no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shear is silent, is silent. So he did not open his mouth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome again. It is my honor today to introduce to you one of my favorite preachers in the Little Rock area. Our speaker for today is a native Arkansan who graduated from Williams Baptist College and earned a master's and a doctoral degree from Truett Theological Seminary of Baylor University in Waco, Texas. He has pastored in Arkansas, Texas, and Oklahoma, but since 2013, he has served the historic Second Baptist Church in downtown Little Rock. In addition to being an outspoken member of the community with regard to social justice, he is also a corporation member of Baptist Health. Please, following our New Testament reading, please welcome with me Dr. Preston Clagg. I am Cindy McLean, a chaplain resident at Baptist Health. Join me in our New Testament reading, Romans 5, 12 through 15. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. 
For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Hi, it's an honor to be with you on Good Friday and to share some thoughts and reflections and prayer on what this day means to us. If you sandwich all four Gospels together, Jesus says seven things from the cross, seven words from the cross. But in the Gospel of Mark, He only says one thing from the cross. And that's what I'd like for us to reflect on together today. In Mark chapter 15, it says this, When the sixth hour was come, that's noon, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, that's three, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, this is a cry of anguish and loneliness, and those two things go together. Whenever we hurt, whenever we cry out in agony, the first thought is, God, where are you? Human pain and human trauma make us feel like we're all alone. And Jesus makes this cry from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've heard this text explained in a number of ways. One of which is that the Father did indeed forsake Jesus on the cross. That Jesus became our sin and a holy God cannot look upon sin. And therefore the Father turned His face away. And yet, I find it helpful to think that this quotation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is just that. A quotation from the Hebrew Bible. This is the first line of Psalm 22. This was a hymn in the Jewish hymnal. Jesus knew His hymns from synagogue. And in those days, the Bible did not have chapter divisions. And so a psalm wasn't known by its number, but by its first line. That was its title. So in Jesus' day, they wouldn't say Psalm 22. In Jesus' day, they would say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I would encourage you when the New Testament quotes the Old to go back and look it up and get a context for the whole macro message of that text. Psalm 22 begins with that cry of anguish. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This wasn't just Jesus' cry. It was the psalmist's cry. But I don't believe it was just the psalmist's cry. I think this was a cry of all humanity. This was a cry that all of us have cried at one time or another. And I bet in this last year during the pandemic, you've heard this cry, if not cried it yourself, in a number of ways. Someone dying of COVID in a hospital room while their nearest family member waits outside in the car. Where are you, God? A mother who just lost her baby. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A husband beside the bed of his wife of 50 years who is breathing her last. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you read the entirety of the psalm, it pivots about halfway through. In verses 22 to 24, it says, Nevertheless, you are not the God who turns your face away from us. You are not the God who turns away. We know this from our history with you. We know this because of the God you've always been. You are not a forsaking kind of God. In fact, you're just the opposite. So if you read the whole of Psalm 22, it begins with the feeling of forsakenness. But at the end, it makes a profession of faith. Nevertheless, despite the evidence, we continue to trust and cling to your faithfulness. I believe that's what Jesus was saying from the cross. I feel forsaken. Nevertheless, I trust beyond what my eyes can see. I trust beyond what my life can live in and of itself. Jesus was professing faith in a God who does not forsake, especially in times of suffering. 
for most of my life, I think I had this backwards. I thought that wherever a good God was, there would be no suffering. But what I have discovered as a minister, a pastor, and a human is that the opposite is true. Wherever there is human suffering, there the good God shows up. And if the cross tells us anything, surely it tells us that. A few years ago, I was on a trip to India with a group of pastors. One day, the pastor in India who was hosting us led us out to a camp for victims of AIDS. He wanted us to speak to them. And on the way out there, I asked the pastor, what, what do you want us to say? He said, in India, AIDS is a death sentence given our standard of health care, and there's a great stigma attached to it to this day. These people are ostracized. We call them the untouchables, and you will see the death in their eyes. And I thought, great, what do I, what do I say to these people? So we arrived at this camp. It was in the middle of nowhere because no one wanted anything to do with these people. And a group gathered and I began to speak to them about Jesus touching lepers, that no one was untouchable to Jesus. I began to speak to them about the image of God being placed upon each of them and the love of God for each and every one of them. As I was speaking, a gentleman came in the back. He was unkempt and he looked dirty. His hair was a mess. And he sat there the whole time with his arms crossed like this, like, I'm not listening to you and I don't care to listen to you. After I finished speaking, each one of those people came by and they had a vial of oil. It was the closest thing to a prescription that they had in that culture. And they wanted me to pray over their oil. I had a translator there with me, and so I'm talking to them as they walk by one by one. And at the end, this gentleman walks by who had had his arms crossed the whole time. And he said to me through the translator, I once was a Hindu priest in a nearby village, but I contracted AIDS and no one wanted anything to do with me. My family forsook me, my friends forsook me, and that's why I am here today. And then he paused and he looked directly in my eyes. And he said, but today your God has become my God because your God is the only God that knows what it feels like to die. This man with AIDS said, Your God has become my God because your God is the only God. And he didn't appeal to power or might. He said, Your God is the only God who knows what it feels like to die. So let me encourage you today as uh, an employee, a partner, a friend of a health system amidst an excruciating pandemic. It is tempting when times are hard and human suffering is on the rise to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we as a nation, as a world, could cry that out in unison today. Might I encourage you with the idea that Jesus cries that right along with us. And the cross tells us that Jesus stands in solidarity with those feelings of forsakenness. He knows what that is about. But might I also encourage you today, because every time that you've encouraged someone, every time you've expressed love, every time you've just shown up in these days, every time you've pressed on in these days, you have been an emblem of the power and the love of God even places and times and seasons that feel God forsaken are not. Even in the middle of a pandemic, even at a cross. Hallelujah. Good morning. My name is Tangi Canada. I'm one of the chaplain residents here at Baptist Health. Please join me as we close today in prayer. Heavenly Father, how great thou art and how gracious your great redemption plan for mankind. We thank you greatly as we walk through this day, commemorate the great love and sacrifice of your beloved son, Jesus. 
We thank you, gracious God, for your great redemption plan through which we are called your offspring and by which we understand there's a forgiveness incomprehensible, a love inexhaustible, and a life unimaginable in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.